the architecturality that Josh just spoke of is the ability to design. So let me just give an example or a metaphor. Imagine you want to build a house. What would you do? You'd get all the elements together, right? You'd get the wood, you'd get the cement. I didn't mean to say we were wood, but wood, <laughs> cement. You'd get the fixtures. You'd get all the pieces, glass that you require for the windows. But if you didn't have a plan, you would just put them together. Maybe if you loved kitchens, you'd have 10 kitchens and no living room. So a plan is necessary, a design is necessary for us to manifest what we want to manifest. So what, how do we design here? It's not like I will, I will erase this, not because it is not what should be, but because it's different from what and how we work. So what we work for is to solve problems. How we will do it is to create new patterns and source our power. So the distinctions that we have in this workshop are distinctions that source our power, distinctions that create new patterns and change, and ways to, to really look at the problem. Not that we have the, the expert skills built into our workshops, we are assuming that each one who comes here knows the, or has the expertise, knows what needs to be done, for example, if you're working on climate change, you know what needs to be done. Or like Jessica works in the, the museum, she knows what needs to be said. So we are assuming that the technical expertise and the tools of the trade for what's done to solve problems exist. But what's new is creating this pattern through which we will work as a seamless design. When we begin such work, we ask people what do you want to solve? Then we ask them another question. If you have a way of solving this, what do you need to shift in the system such that your solution is not a one-off, not just a project, but a sustainable? And then we ask another question. What if the problem that you solve shifts a pattern that's giving rise to the same problem, shifts the pattern, but is sourced in wisdom, in our power. What if? Because once we can source it that way, then we can address a spectrum of problems because this method is not unique to any theme or subject. We say it's subject agnostic. You can use it to solve issues related to climate change. You can use it for health. You can use it for political change. You can use it for a whole education. Yeah, examples like Mel and, and what you're doing for housing, for example. Yes, well, you know, one of the projects of United Global Shift is working within the community boards of New York City and actually having people create whatever projects they work on, which they do always work on projects. There are committees and projects all the time and have them source it from this model so that not only do they do things that will solve an immediate problem, but they build a new system that will then create sustainability around that issue. So Monica, why don't you give us an example of, you know, we say system, system, and when I first started wor working with Monica, I didn't know what the heck she was talking about. I was like, what is a system? And my husband said it to me really, really simply, which I like to use, which is, it's how things work. It's how, how things work. So if you look at the plumbing system in your house, that's how your water works. That's how your plumbing works. Or if you look at your biological system, if you're bleeding, you know, a Band-Aid might help the bleeding, but it doesn't deal with the systemic cause of your bleeding. So give us an example of some systems. It's exactly what you said. Oh, you just gave an example through me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and the financial, the entire financial yes. world is a system. Money is a system. Health is a system, energy is a system. They're usually written and unwritten rules, mm. both in, the, in our societies, the norms that we hold, as well as in our formal uh, systems. For example, uh, so every society has a point of view on what is all right and what is not all right. It is okay for women to work or it's not okay for women to work, for example. And it's held in different cultures in a different way or 
in different, so that's something we would say is the thinking or the normative thinking of that culture that gives rise to the, the rules of the game, the way it's organized. And then there are formal rules of the game, which is what's enacted in law, in policy, in constitutions, which determine who has access, what is okay, who can say what, and how can we organize. So in this work, we stimulate critical thinking, so a word about systems. So the systems are there, whether we recognize them or we don't. And in our work, we show a film, it's called Story of Stuff, mm. in the first workshop, and we show another one. In the second workshop, which is called Life and Death, they're both about stimulating your way of thinking. So when we see this film, Story of Stuff, we ask people, we don't tell them, we ask them, what do you see? And what they see are the real principles behind any system. Firstly, it's wonderful that we connect all the pieces of the puzzle because by connecting all the pieces, we know we can act through one of those pieces. It gives us an understanding that whichever piece we enter from, whichever door we enter from in that system, we can make change. The second thing someone will always say, ah, I did not understand. There were so many constituencies all working for the same thing. Academia, government, corporation, people, citizens, um, people in, co in companies producing, the consumer. So somehow, different constituencies inside a society maintain the system. So the big challenge is, or the big opportunity is, that if we start thinking differently, can we sort of look at this big picture and see what could we do different? So it's interesting how people come up with that. The third thing they say is we didn't realize that much of what we see and buy or do, because in this case the film is about buying, but in, in, in another case it, just it could be about doing, much of what we see is not the complete picture that most of the system is largely invisible, that getting a handle on it is vital for leveraging change. And it's not invisible by accident, it's invisible by design. In fact, we are trained not to see systems for the most part. We're trained to see what's in front of us by that video game, you know, by that iPod, by that new computer. You know, we're not trained to see what is the system behind that whole world of consumerism that keeps it going, that contributes to climate change, that contributes to poverty, that contributes to the education system, that it contributes to really everything, not just the economy. And when you look at all these systems and you look at human beings within them, because one thing that's missing in the systems is human beings, but human beings create the systems, when you get that human beings created these systems, you get that they're not these things out there that are immalleable. They are literally invented by human beings so we as human beings could invent new systems that actually foster dignity and interdependence and oneness and compassion rather than systems that could potentially foster destruction or greed or... And we, we acknowledge that the, many of these systems were designed with the intention of serving human beings. That there are some unintended consequences and a few intended consequences. So we, this is not about blame. This is about looking at what may have been the right way of thinking at some point in time, which you and I know is not working. 